So the, the, the evening will be mostly in English. So welcome to because the, the audience will be uh, very international tonight. We are very lucky for that. So welcome to France. We always start late and we all talk with weird accents. So you have to, to get used to that during all the VOGP summit. So I won't be long. Uh, it will be a short introduction before a series of uh, announcements for this night, which has been organized by Open Democracy Now, which is a coalition of uh, NGOs working uh, together to organize hackathons for the Civic Tech. Also, a partner in this, in this evening is uh, GovZero from Taiwan and the Open Culture Foundation. So after this series of announcements, we'll have uh, a series of pitch of international projects from a dozen of different countries. And then we, you can all get back to, to the wine and the, <laughs> and the beer and, and, and the food. Um, the, tonight it will be recorded as well because the French National TV is uh, shooting a documentary so if you don't want to be featured, you just have to ask them to be uh, removed from the video. And now I'm going to ask CLKU to come, to, to come here to, to present you the new Gov Zero website we are launching. Yeah, first I would like to warmly uh, thank, uh, thank uh, Nomi Ganger, who is our host tonight. Yeah. Good night to everyone. Just a few words to tell you where you are. I think it's important to know where you are. So you are uh, in Le Square. Le Square in French it means uh, it's a public garden. It's supposed to be a place where you can breathe or you can play. Uh, it is a Renault Open Innovation Lab. We have three of them. We have one in Silicon Valley, one in Tel Aviv, and one in Paris. So we are very pleased to welcome you for this event tonight. Uh, why do we have Open Innovation Lab? It's because we finally understood that uh, we are not only car makers, but uh, mobility services providers. So it's a big shift, and we are living this shift uh, nowadays, so it's very interesting. And we, it, it means that we have to connect and to play with our ecosystem. And we are very proud not to connect only with technical stuff, but also to connect with social trends and subjects like yours tonight. So welcome for this event and uh, have a pleasant night. Good evening, Paris. Hello, everyone. So I'm CL. I'm from the future. I mean, time zone. Yes, uh, we are kind of. <laughs> um, so, uh, how many of you are here for the OGP summit? And how many of you are doing open data? And how many of you are doing CV Tech? We have an awesome company. Great. <laughs> So, um, Taiwan is a really tiny place. You can probably fit into an English channel if you try carefully. So, um, but, uh, well, so this is me. I'm CL. I do software. So, even if I'm in the hospital, I still like to code. I do great stuff. Um, so, four years ago, I started the um, city tech community in Taiwan called the Zero. And so, it's like replacing the job with the O with a zero. So, it's like a prototype government. And it combines the spirit of open source and the uh, hands-on idea, like we just start doing things, trying to break things, and I see if it works. And it turned out that if you see this um, awesome research by a, a Dutch uh, researcher about all the city tech movement and all the city tech repository on GitHub, in his analysis, uh, you can see a cluster of people collaborating. Down there, the red part is the uh, Code for America and Friends. And up there, uh, it's like uh, Open Knowledge Network. 
and a bunch of other European uh, collaborations. And there is a huge chunk of people from Taiwan. And given the size of Taiwan and the population, about 23 million, uh, we think that it's a really vibrant community in, in this uh, whole global city tech community. <coughs> so really brief uh, summary about Gov0. Uh, we started in 2012, and it's sort of like a multi-centralized community. We have many task forces doing different things. Some of them running the summit, some of them running the uh, media relations, some of them organizing the hackathons. And we have about 2,300 people on Slack right now. And uh, it's, it's a good mix of people. We start to have a lot of people from the government trying to use this way of open collaboration uh, inspired by the community. So we're seeing interesting innovation in the government as well now, uh, being like from the community. So a couple of projects we did before, one of them, the first one is actually visualizing budget, which is like, uh, happening a lot in the world. But what's most interesting that the Gov Zero NAND was started to see we are forking the government, not not the F word, but for the government, <laughs> by creating a, a better version of that. But eventually, because it's open source, we want it to be merged back to the government. So three years after I created this first project, the Taipei City government took my code and turned it into the official way to announce budget. So this is like really well received in the, in the media as well. More than that, they, they are collecting feedback on this website. And then, uh, I think during the period of the budget, they got like about 200 or 300 uh, feedback. And then on the individual budget line, they asked the, the, um, the ministry or the agency that's responsible for that to actually respond to the budget. So they actually explained in detail why they put, took this budget into uh, more or less from this year. We also create voters' guide, um, so combining all the data that we can get from asset, asset disclosure and uh, company registry, and for the candidate, we combine that into a voter guide, and actually we made the uh, election commission in Taiwan to embrace open data. So this election, past election in January, they actually released the official statement, official platform, and the basic information for the candidates in a JSON format. Shocking. <laughs> So, um, and that effort has spread across the, uh, the country to be like not just the global, uh, not just the national parliament, but also the local council. And we're focusing a lot more on more effective participation, not just disclosing information through open data and visualization. We're trying to see how technology can sort of fix democracy right? and how we can build a tool that is not just like getting uh, half a million people on the street, but also getting half a million people to decide on funds counting, coming into some conclusion or a consensus. So we try a lot of different tools. Uh, this one is POLIS, which is quite interesting. And uh, this is during the, um, the Uber debate in Taiwan that we were trying to see if um, the conversation can happen between people who are pro-Uber and against Uber. And this tool has been proven quite useful, and, uh, but I won't go through the details. Um, we probably have uh, Audrey Tan, which is one of the active contributors in the community who was recently appointed as the digital minister in Taiwan. Uh, she's going to do a presentation on Democracy Night uh, on the ACE, so the two days after. Yeah, so that would probably be the story. Well, she's there in the middle, and she used to be in the community, now she's the government. So it's sort of like merging back to the government. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the, 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 open, the God Zero is an open community, so it's like, it's not really a legal entity. So about two years ago, we set up a foundation in Taiwan called the Open Culture Foundation. And that's not just the civic tech uh, community, but also from the open source community around Taiwan. And so we have a very vibrant open source community. We have about 12 uh, large technical conferences on open source software every year. And so we set up this foundation to act as a legal um, like the front door for uh, everything that the community is doing. And another part of the important mission for the foundation is to foster uh, international collaboration, telling the story about what we're doing and what others are doing. Because in the civic tech movement, I think we need a lot more collaboration to see how we can move forward. So one of the things we did uh, in foundation this year is to organize uh, this great Taiwanese delegation to OGP Summit. So we have about 22 people uh, from Taiwan, uh, a lot of them from civil society. So if you see uh, like a Taiwanese space during the summit, feel free to have a friendly chat with them. <laughs> Each of them has a great story. They all mostly run their own NGO and then, and then have a different idea about how technology should, should be able to help uh, further to do uh, the civil society and the open government movement in general. One other thing we want to announce today is that we're launching Got Zero News. 
So, uh, well, the URL is there, dot zero news. So um, the idea is that the civic tech community around the world always try to connect, try to collaborate, try to reuse code in different ways. But it's really, really hard for uh, people to get an update on what's going on in Estonia, what's going on in Chile, because we always wait for them to write updates, and people are always too busy or, or to, to slack or to, uh, I guess it's probably not arrested by the government, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided that uh, we will do this initiative. We'll hire journalists to actually knock on your door, arrest you to see, hey, what are you up to? What's this cool new project about that's only in uh, Korean language I don't understand? Can you have like half, half an hour to talk to us about what's happening? We're going to write in English to uh, talk to the global community. So a lot of things are happening in, in Asia, like in, in Korea, Japan, and Malaysia, but it's not a lot uh, in, in terms of international coverage. A lot of movement, they have used some technology to, to, try, to, um, to try to make uh, new things in the movement but the rest of the world does not know about, doesn't know about that. So uh, we are launching it today, and uh, we just have, I guess, do we have an English uh, story already? All right. Yes, so um, so sit tight, and then, and then if you have an interesting story to share, feel free to tell us, and then uh, the, our journalists will talk to you, and then uh, hopefully we'll get, when, when it's going rolling, and we'll have a submission from uh, places around the world. So lastly, I want to share with you a little story. So some of you might have heard that the U.S. passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and that's the, the act that in, ensure that uh, women are not discriminated in workplace. So you, you're entitled to equal pay, uh, equal salary uh, in the workplace. And some people argue that this is uh, a fact that the FDA approved the, the birth pill, birth control pill in 1960. So it's a new technology that enables uh, half of the population to have control of their own body. And that sort of in turn gives people or the society as a whole a new idea about how rights, basic rights should be. Similarly, two uh, economists argue that washing machine is a more important invention than the internet. Um, 1920, uh, women start to be able to vote, and it's in the US. And, and people argue that uh, it's just because uh, 1910, uh, the, the invention of washing machine liberated half of the labor because you were sort of forced into doing this without work every day. But with the technology, the whole society actually have a new idea about what equal rights should be, what general uh, idea for equality should be. Mm -hmm. So I guess in this scattering of uh, awesome civic tech movement, we should think about what technology should have as an impact because this it could be like far more than we imagined ever. So let's do that together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It will be a, a great help for the international community to work, to work together. And then, when Dr. Caroline is going to, to present you the, the process which uh, led to the to the evening tonight, uh, which is the the uh, Open Democracy Network of Syria. And I'm just going to break the. Hi, everybody. I'm Caroline, and I will uh, tell you the story of the Open Democracy Network project that is about to celebrate its first year uh, in January. So everything began in January 2016 uh, when civic tech initiatives were blossoming, were blossoming everywhere. Um, 2016 was a kind of momentum and uh, we realized that there was a, a danger. We realized that um, there were kind of incentives, uh, very um, inconsistencies, very, uh, that could be a, a, a that were inconsistent that could represent a great danger of uh, democracy because uh, many, um, many consultation tools that were used were uh, based on proper proprietary software. So we started to think uh, of a solution and uh, that's why we created the Open Democracy Now project that is a permanent hackathon to develop collaboratively uh, tools for the democracy. 
uh, with through the free and based on free and open source uh, software. So we did it with uh, five uh, over associations, and uh, yeah, uh, very very uh, quickly our goals uh, evolved. They changed because we wanted to add um, a reflection uh, based on the methodology and the values that should uh, go with uh, consultations and uh, civic uh, movement uh, approaches. Uh, the idea for us. Uh, was to, to work on the, on the trust because the trust is a very uh, key notion in this process and uh, we learned that it, uh, we learned that we, we needed to uh, give confidence uh, in such, with, give uh, citizens confidence in, uh, in these tools uh, to really um, turn that so um, <coughs> how we did this we did a recurring event uh, that means that uh, we organized uh, great meetings every two months and uh, between these uh, great meetings uh, we worked uh, with every project that participated in the in the academy. We also had, uh, it was a very inclusive uh, project, so we had only one criteria to participate in the project, it was to be uh, free and, uh, and open source. And then, um, yeah, so, uh, if we look at uh, what we did, uh, we organized five hackathons, um, around five main topics that are informing citizens, uh, opening institutions, and developing a consulting platform, also acting internationally, and also thinking of, uh, of, about um, applications for the blockchain uh, for the democracy. Um, we know uh, for each hackathon we have a kind of 300 people that participate in the hackathon. We also uh, gather like uh, 2,000, no sorry, 300 uh, registered people, uh, 200 participants and uh, we, we, we really grew up because at the beginning we had only 5 projects and now we have 40, about 45 projects that, that work with us. Uh, we also developed uh, new partnerships. The idea was to widen the community. So we had new partnerships with uh, medias, with uh, coding school, and with open source communities such as uh, events that uh, work in this field to strengthen our actions. And uh, if we look at what we did, uh, I think that we really uh, managed to create a, a comprehensive approach for open innovation in civic tech. We now gather the community that shares a common uh, view uh, of what civic tech should be. And uh, we also uh, created a, a toolbox, uh, I mean uh, a series of uh, tools that are ready for use uh, tools for civic tech. Uh, about our next step, so we want to uh, enjoy uh, the OGP Summit uh, to talk with all of you to share best practices, to learn from your experiences and maybe to gather our resources and our energies for 2070s. And then, for next year we have some ideas. We would like to explore, kind of, uh, we, want, we would like to explore new topics that are education and that are new media because it's really important to uh, think how we uh, inform uh, citizens. There are two approaches in which we can uh, build um, um, things to uh, to re to uh, to think. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sick and very very tired. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yes, so had these two new topics and then scale up our action uh, with organizing uh, hackathons in other cities, not only in Paris and in other countries. If you find, if we find uh, motivated uh, people to, to organize them with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we're going to focus on a rather, rather projects less uh, less broad. We have the lighting talks, so we are going to focus on several international projects. <coughs> Sorry, and we organized uh, the slides randomly, so we are just going to go. Hello? Uh, good evening. 
Uh, my name is Anna Alberts and uh, I'm from Open Knowledge Germany and I was told that I only have five minutes. So together with Scoopy Doo, uh, get ready so that we can run through Open Knowledge Germany's projects because we are a broad organization. We advocate for uh, open data and its use all over Germany. So we have a ton of projects and I want to run through it with you. Um, so the first and our biggest project is Code for Germany. We have 25 labs all over Germany where developers, hackers, uh, policy wonks come together every week uh, to work on civic tech projects together. Um, and now their latest big project is the Prototype Fund. And in Prototype Fund, uh, we have 1.2 million for open source projects. And we divide that uh, to the community, um, no, we divide that uh, in to uh, open source projects um, that applied to us. Our first round was a huge success. Uh, we had over 500 applications, and that was so much that we're still in the selection procedures. Uh, we expected maybe 70 applications, and it was 500. And the second round is already planned for the 1st of February, so keep that in mind. Um, there is 30,000 per open source project, um, if you apply. Uh, then our other big community project is Jugendhackt. That is hacking with young programmers. Um, we've been doing this for the past five years. We started in Berlin and now we are not just in Berlin, we're all over Germany and uh, in Austria, Switzerland and even in South Korea this year. Um, and then um, our final community project is Damenschule. Uh, that's uh, the German version of School of Data, and it teaches you. Uh, it will teach you all the data. Um, it is data literacy for civil society organizations, and the first big project is together with an education organization in Germany, uh, mapping all education data. Um, now to our political projects. Um, our biggest fragment. Our big one, our oldest one, is Fragmentstat. It's a FOIA uh, request portal. We help uh, journalists uh, advocate uh, civil society organizations with, um, and individuals interested in politics with their FOIA request. But we also use it as a tool to um, get loads of new open data out, uh, as we did with Zeerwoutachten, where we got all the parliamentary re uh, reports published proactively online on this uh, web portal Zeerwood Achten. And now we start, since yesterday, this has launched, um, Transparen uh, Transparenzplanen, which stands for um, Transparency Lawsuits, where we're going to sue the state uh, strategically uh, for uh, certain uh, FOIA requests that have been rejected. So that's the newest from this one. And now I wanted to highlight two um, projects from our community to show you what also comes not just from our team, but also from the wider community where we work together with. Um, Kleine Anfrage was started by Maxi, and um, he just scraped all the parliamentary requests all over Germany and put that into big and small requests to uh, the government by parliamentarians, and made it all searchable. And Ernesto Luca is a long-term community member, also working voluntarily with our team, and uh, in Politik by, on, by uns, uh, politics at, with us. He actually scraped all the council member, uh, council, municipal council websites, and um, in, and put them actually in a useful system. And actual council members are actually using his politics by own portals because they're more usable than their own council, uh, than their own municipal council websites. And finally, uh, we have three research, three European research projects. First one is my own project, Open Budget to You. Um, works on innovation and financial transparency in Europe. The second one is DUIST, works on uh, portals for uh, public procurement and will be launching its portals today. And uh, finally, uh, we have Odine, which um, um, is funding, uh, has been funding for the last two years uh, open data, uh, startups using open data. Um, all over Europe. And um, was this all too fast? Was this way too much? I can imagine. Um, <laughs> you can come visit us. Uh, we have a data summit planned in Berlin and you can hear all around about these projects in detail on the 28th and the 29th of April. So um, please note it. 
And we are of course here at the OGP, and then uh, you can ask me and my colleagues about all our different projects. Uh, here I'm going to take some time for so that you can note it down. Uh, Arne Semschot from Vlaaglinstaat and uh, Vlaaglinstaat, uh, so the transparency um, lawsuit will be speaking, uh, has, has a pitch about this uh, on the 8th of December at Vilaan. Uh, Tools to Track Corruption and Engage Stakeholders is a workshop where Mara Mendes from the Public Procurement website, Deaconess, will speak <coughs> on the 9th of December. Um, I will be speaking in a short pitch, also on the 8th of December, 15 minutes before Arne uh, at a quarter to 10. Julia Pleuva um, will be uh, presenting uh, all our work, also the Prototype Fund, uh, at the Fork and Merch uh, Roundtable. Walter Palmatov from the ODI. Um, will present his learnings, um, also in a pitch, and finally we will of course contribute to the open uh, government updates all around the world with our newest uh, coordinator for uh, the open government partnership in Germany, Johanna Tudel, who sits over there. And also if you have more questions, you can ask Helena Hahn, who is head of the Datenschule. So that's it for us. Hello. Uh, so I'm going to present the work of uh, an uh, the foundation I'm part of that is based in, in San Francisco. So our, our tackle is very systemic. Um, we've been looking at all the software we've been developing in the past 10 years for Civic Tech. And it's really great, I mean, like, Romeo, Collaborative Tickpads, Open Data, it's really nice, and I think we've done some amazing things organizing together. But if we look at it, in some ways, those tools are made to make uh, our movements horizontal, decentralized, more bottom up. But if we look at it as a systemic perspective, basically, all the power is concentrated in one hand. So it's the system administrator, who is basically the king of our digital democracy when we use uh, governance uh, tools online. So this is really uh, kind of a problem that is if we look at it because they can actually turn, up, turn, on, turn off our application, they can erase there, but the problem really is is that they don't even ask for the responsibility. So the tackle, we, this is the problem we want to tackle, is how do we build incorruptible decentralized governance tools so that we can take meaningful decisions online and uh, because we trust the infrastructure that we are using. So our focus is put really on using the new kind of technologies that appeared in the five past years that are called blockchain, but mainly Bitcoin, because they are decentralized, they are secured, and if, we, if you sell actually all your data that you, you, you are producing using the digital tools, you are making them secure because everybody can audit, everybody can audit them, and you can give us back. So you can actually trust the decision once it's made and it's sent to the blockchain. So we've been working on, on, on that kind of software, uh, the, that is, uh, the, our main release now is called Sovereign. It's an application that basically where you can uh, create proposals, uh, vote on them. We implement some liquid democracy feature so to make participation more dynamic because people can never vote. Uh, we also implement some uh, new new features of kind of voting. We, we don't think that we should have like one vote for one issue for voter. We think like votes should be more than more complex and we allocate a range of votes every time a user subscribes. So he, only, he not only has to position on a topic, but also has to allocate uh, a number of votes per topic, so you have to tackle with the scarcity, scarcity of votes, and it's much more, uh, much more, that, much more complex, uh, and gives a more gamma of emotions when, when someone is voting. Uh, we also work also on a decentralized identity component, but, uh, I think one pitch is going to present that tonight, but we don't think that a uh, platform online should own our identity and we should on our, our identity on our phone and maybe secure it on the blockchain and just by scanning a QR code you could log in using that and uh, we also think that many of the problems we have is that uh, because of the, the, not the toxic uh, nation state uh, politics that uh, we are now creating because we are turning, we are going from um, an open world to a more uh, closed world in the term of uh, 
economic politics, migration politics, and how we think of others. And we basically think that uh, this is not uh, a good uh, path we are on. And uh, as a community, we have to organize online. We think that the internet is the right uh, scale to actually organize internationally. So I'm very glad to see you all here. And I hope we can do lots of things together. And I think I'm finished. So, uh, yeah. oh yeah, I have just one last uh, slide. Uh, so, you might be wondering how we are going to implement this with Bitcoin. It's kind of hard. And lots of people are talking about, like, yeah, basically blockchain is bullshit. But uh, we really think like Bitcoin is a real opportunity because today you have that new kind uh, of uh, side chains that you can use who are basically the same thing as Bitcoin, which is much more rapid. You don't have the transaction lagging. Uh, the one that we, use, what, that we use is called 21 Computer. So every time a person registers on the platform, it's creating a wallet, a proposal in the wallet, and you just uh, exchange tokens uh, between each other, and then you, you just certify the whole thing by flushing all that happens in your system on Bitcoin. So this is what we are doing. We are going to be at the hackathon, uh, the OGP hackathon. We can show something. It's not really ready yet. It's, it's only been a year. But uh, if you have some questions, I'll be around. And uh, thank you a lot. I am working with this application that is called Self. Uh, this is some kind of sub project within Sovereign Application, the application that uh, Virgil spent before. And why we did Self? Because we believe that before decentralized democracy, we need to decentralize identities. Okay? So, well, this is Self. Identity management with the Well, it's a super application. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, how we manage identity round? Okay, we have email and password. Third party validators. It's like you say to the site, the site, uh, you want to log in into the site, it says, say you, hi, you need to validate your identity with Facebook, Gmail, or GitHub. If you use, if you use Facebook, you will see like we need to access all these identities, all, all this information from you. They can see even what did you know that some. So after a while, you say, okay, I'm logging. And the site knows everything about you. You can do nothing. If you want to log in, you need to give all your information to the site. And what we are doing right now, we use public and private keys. It's like Bitcoin. This is like this is like the talk with the server. You want to log into the server, the server says, Hey, who are you? And you say, I am ABC, it's your public key, it's a long street the public key. And it's unique. And yes, if prove it that you are in ABC, I will send you this this message encrypted with your public key. This is like of this world. This is crypt cryptography. And, this, and then you receive that information, you use your private key, you de decrypt, I mean, you get the, the message from that encrypted message, and you say to the, to the site, hey, this is my identity, this, this is what, what you say, let it be like. By the way, my username is Lucas, because I only want to show you my username, I don't want to show you my email, my Twitter account, anything. You only will, will have access to my username. And say says yes, okay, you are welcome. And this is the application working. So you get self, and this is my identity, the things that I want to show. This is like Bitcoin works with public and private keys. So you generate this, they random, you move the mouse, and after a while you have these two keys. So you scan the first one, the public and then the secret. And then you create your profile, this is your information. Okay? Then you scan the QR code from the, from the page that you want to log in, you scan it, and you validate the information, that this is the, the URL that you want to access, 
and this is uh, the name of the organization and the document that they provide. And if you are okay, you are successfully loaded. Okay. Now, what are the advantages? Now you control your information. Nobody else control. I mean, this your, your information is not in a server. It's in your pocket. It's in your phone. And you and you sh and you decide what to show to the, to the site. What information would you want? You turn on the. I want to show you my email, my name, my Twitter account. And there is no third-party validators. That means there is no tracking. Nobody track what you are doing in in internet. Well, if you want to use it, this is open source. This is in GitHub. This, I mean, we have the mobile application, the server application, and an example. So you can integrate this with your own sites and with your your icons, your your image. And we will be in the hackathon, in the RGB. So if you want to contact us, just. Lucas. Thank you. So we have Alberto Ayuno, you're right. Because I haven't seen him. So we'll just wait a little bit. Um, yes, I have come in.
and information about the building to tell people about uh, its properties, its owners, or uh, its purpose, like that. So we're using these two tools uh, to do disaster relief in Taiwan. And why do we need them both? Uh, uh, we're trying, first of all, we're trying to engage uh, local communities to use OpenStreetMap for their disaster, disaster reduction and relief work because uh, a map is very, va very, very valuable information when you're uh, dealing with like floodings or uh, typhoons or air earthquakes, such, such kind of disasters. But we found that it's very kind of, uh, it's uh, harder to engage uh, local communities to directly edit a winter map. Because, uh, a map for ordinary people, imagine if it's a community volunteers that wants to uh, do some uh, contribute to their communities, a map for him might be uh, a bit too, too hard to understand without any context. Because uh, these volunteers, they're like doing, uh, they're, they might be, uh, uh, they might be very familiar uh, with their community, but they're not very familiar with, with a map or more abstract information. So we find that it's much easier to give them a storytelling platform because their experience are more uh, are more often uh, generated from their actual experience when interacting with, the, with their environment. So uh, what we did was we built this local wiki uh, website so that communities can use this website to uh, record their understanding of the environment and then we try to build other tools to extract valuable, valuable data from these uh, stories and experiences. So this is one of the page that uh, the local volunteers have, uh, been, have been building to help uh, their inhabitants to understand the environmental risk in their community. And what if there is a flooding or, or, or a typhoon that's what's happening in the place where could you find uh, shelters or uh, resources to help you uh, survive? And these are uh, some of the information that they have collected during the time uh, And these, these are the history of the places that uh, historically are, are, uh, high, uh, are very risky and uh, has a high potential of flooding. Uh, uh, and, what, uh, okay. and what we have uh, enhanced these, uh, the, the local wiki software is we have added some more integration features with OpenStreetMap, so that when the community is using the local wiki, they can directly pull uh, open data from OpenStreetMap. So if they are editing a map of the community, they can directly search and query uh, the features and in import those data from OpenStreetMap. They don't have to draw the map themselves. And if they cannot find the system, if the system cannot find the data in OpenStreetMap, the system will guide those users to contribute back to the OpenStreetMap. So the system is not only is importing data from OpenStreetMap, it's also helping the users to contribute back to the OpenStreetMap. And we're also uh, working with the government to import a lot of open data into uh, this uh, local wiki platform so that uh, the community, when they're, they're first time opening the, the, uh, the local wiki website about their community, they, they can see a lot of data from uh, the government that are concerning their, their uh, environment. So in this way, we're hoping that OpenStreetMap can become, uh, sorry, local wiki can become a platform that incorporates official data which is from the govern government and unofficial data which is from the community and so that these two uh, data sources can complement <coughs> each other and help with uh, both at each other. And uh, this website has, uh, is currently in beta and uh, we are
it's a joint work with a few, uh, several mappers in Taiwan, OpenStreetMap community, and with uh, the National Science and Technology Center of Disaster Reduction of Taiwanese government. And uh, I'll be in the OGDF uh, Toolbox Hackathon in, during the summit, and if anyone is interested in this one, project, you're welcome to talk to me or work with me on that. Thank you very much. We are a team of four people. We are, uh, we are one of the few civic tech organizations in Southeast Asia. By Southeast, and we actually work with a few countries in Southeast Asia. By Southeast Asia, we really just mean Malaysia and Myanmar. And that's about it. Alright, uh, we work on quite a number of projects, but the only concern, I'm going to talk to you about Popolo. Actually, more like Popit. Uh, fun fact, we have no idea how to call this project uh, because I call this Popit NG. Uh, based on the original version uh, developed by my society in UK but the, the rest of the time, uh, team prefer to call this Poppy uh, 2.0 So what is this? Uh, the story is we need a parliamentary website to represent our representative in data format So we borrowed a lot of ideas In fact, literally implement the people and organization side of Popolo Actually, by the way, uh, James at the back uh, we steal a lot of his ideas by the way So, awesome! Um, we also implemented API because we need some extra feature. For example, the parliamentary side in Malaysia are very research driven. Uh, we do not have one source because the government do not provide the data for the first place. So to actually implement this to support our data to feed the workflow for researching, uh, we implemented uh, what we call a per field uh, citation. So literally every name, every surname, every field that you find top below can be cited because uh, understanding where the source is in data is very important. It's something that we steal from journalism because a uh, source needs to be confirmed. That's one of the first rules. And it actually works surprisingly well. Uh, it works so well, we actually implement, uh, we realized two things. One, it's actually very cool to work with data and number two, uh, we can use this beyond just uh, parliamentary information. If I can get used to the, this cable, okay. So for example, uh, one of the issues we have in, oh, this is oh, wrong, wrong set, give me a moment. Okay, so one of the things that we learn uh, from the parliamentary website is one, uh, Malaysia, uh, we can use this beyond just parliamentary. Uh, we can actually, it's surprisingly easy to represent this for companies and board of directors. It's good because in Malaysia, we can, uh, we have serious conflict of interest, uh, which we can actually see. And is, uh, okay, this one are members of parliament. Uh, I only show this because we produce pretty pictures. But actually, uh, inside we'll show a good Yes, uh, pretty pictures, but it also shows uh, some conflict of interest because this person is a member of parliament that is happened to be board director for one of the investment firms and they also involve the board directors of companies. So in most countries, this we consider as conflict of interest. And it turns out that portfolio is awesome to represent uh, this kind of workflow, not just for parliament and parliaments and committees. But in the other day, uh, we can do a lot of stuff, but we also ask what's the point? Because one problem is how to take action from this data. 
So we are asking this for some time, right? Here's the cool thing that is happening for the last few years. We should also keep that for now. So Myanmar uh, actually wants a parliamentary website. The thing is, uh, they are still new technically speaking, so they do not know uh, how should we implement, how should they implement their parliamentary site? Should they build from data first? Should they, which standard to follow? Do we, do they even have a standard for the first place? So they come to us and decided that let's implement a version. We literally we install a version of our public API for member purposes. And it served a few, quite a number of reasons. One is it's a very good test case for multiple language support. Uh, Malaysia, the Malay language just use Roman language, so we can shoot a little. But Myanmar, they have to use Burmese. Uh, fun fact, uh, this project is implemented in Python, and we have some localization issue with Burmese. So try to, doing a Google search on Burmese Python always shows me invasive species of snake in Florida. I never understand why. Okay, by the way, uh, so what happened is, uh, in between we figure out the two function issue, technically speaking, but here's the interesting thing that actually, more important thing that is actually happening in Myanmar. Uh, originally, then only one website. So, we, but instead of giving API first, so they can easily build their own website. Awesome. But here's the best thing that happened. Uh, because we started with API, the Myanmar team actually built a mobile app directly without waiting for us. More often than not, when people build a financial website, they will actually create a website, then create an API, wait for a while before they can create a, create a mobile app. The Myanmar team, the Open Dota team, without waiting for us to do any conversion, they start and creating their own mobile application. And why do I say this is important? Ideally, you do not have to wait for anyone to create anything that you need. So that's to us is actually very important. And I think Myanmar is also a very good use case because uh, before this, I actually say about the team asking what's the point of creating such an advanced civil tech when the society not when the uptake is not that great. Myanmar is a very good reason. When a society is ready for it, the tool is ready for, to serve them and they can actually have a very powerful tool to, take the, to do whatever they want, to do whatever they want. So the point of doing civic tech in an environment that might seem demoralizing, you know, when a society is ready, they can use our tools, the impact will be very strong. And that's it, thank you very much. So you just ask uh, Virgil about the details, but there will be a three day workshop on it uh, starting uh, tomorrow from the Agathon of the Elysee Palace and then at the Palais de Liana for uh, the rest of the summit. So and now we have yet another Frenchman, it's not through, and I think I saw him right this this year. Hi everyone. <coughs> Hello. Hey. Uh, well, so I just discovered this afternoon that I was supposed to say something today. So I have absolutely no slides, nothing. Woohoo! I just wanted to share with you uh, some news about um, uh, the French Civil Society that has uh, published a press release yesterday. So 11 organizations from uh, the French Civil Society have uh, published um, that they let's say, disagree with uh, some of um, the government policies. And in particular, they complain about the fact that uh, on the one hand, the government is announcing, um, you know, telling stories about open government, and at the same time, maybe some, the, the reality is not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, doesn't really match the, those stories. So if you want to read about that, there is a, an English version of the press release which is just one page long, that has been published on several websites of those uh, of the CSOs. So you can go, for instance, to the Republic Citoyen website, 
or Magasit Royale's website, or Appy website, or Democracy OS website, Petio website, and find this uh, press release. Add uh, the full English version, which is about 10 pages long, <coughs> which describes in detail the, the things we're complaining about, uh, will hopefully be available tomorrow. Uh, it's being, I mean, the translation is being crowdsourced at the moment, so hopefully it would be uh, it would be available. At, I mean, maybe if we do this interactively, if you have maybe a couple of questions, because I have nothing else to say. So, <laughs> see if you have a couple of questions about that, I, I, I can answer them. Yes. Hey, uh, Alex Howard from the Cement Foundation. Uh, we met over email earlier right, today. Right. Okay. So hey. your press release is much more strongly worded than what you just said here. Yes. Uh, you accuse the government of France of open washing. Could you please maybe give a couple of examples of something that they're doing and then not actually fessing up to? Or examples of something they are doing that doesn't reflect perhaps the vision that you all have for open government? Okay. Um, so there are several ways to answer that because we address a certain number of issues. One issue that we're addressing is, is the fact that uh, for us, for all those uh, 11 CSOs, participation, consultation is a serious thing. Uh, even where you're experimenting it, so it means that uh, there should be a precise methodology, we should follow that, we should take into account people's uh, opinions, explain to them why, why we're taking into account this opinion, maybe not that one, um, and then you know build the law according to what I mean because it's a, to, uh, to to create a, for instance a new, a new law about something. So it, for instance the the, the loi république numérique, so it's the fundamental law about digital in France that has been uh, passed. I mean that passed a few a few weeks ago, a few months ago. So there was a participation process. Um, several CSOs have been invited to uh, contribute to that. Uh, plenty of citizens have been invited to contribute to that, and it was presented with words such as expressions such as we write, "Let's write the law together," which supposes that you know we're really writing it together. Actually. And um, some CSOs, even though they might not have been very confident that their opinion would be taken into account, tried it. Okay, so they, they went to the platform, they contributed to the um, to this consultation. Uh, there were some votes. Some of those votes, I mean, showed that you know people really wanted, for instance, that free software would be used in public administrations, in particular for education. Uh, some of those people, sh I mean, really wanted that uh, knowledge commons would have a precise definition in the law, and uh, you know it would be promoted. Uh, and several other things, and for instance, regarding open, uh, free software, uh, regarding those commons, the first version of the bill that was released by the government didn't even mention them. I mean, it was just removed. And uh, apparently I was not there, but I mean, that's what has been told by several other CSOs that have followed this uh, in much more detail. Uh, it, it seems that uh, there were some corporate lobbies that came to the government and said, we don't want that. And they just removed it. So that's one major thing that we're pointing out. I mean, you can't really do open government and consultations without explaining in, in detail how it's going to happen. Um, and let people agree whether they want to participate or not. Another example was that the, uh, the company that has released the software and the platform that has been used during this consultation and many others um, actually claims that they use free software, they claim that they use open data, uh, they claim that they build uh, creative commons, uh, but actually they don't. And when they were asked several times to release the code, when they were asked to uh, release the data, they just refused. I mean, in so at the beginning they said, we will do it, we will do it, we will do it, just sign the contract, we will do it, we will do it. And then, you know, at some point they were forced to, uh, I mean, to, to recognize that uh, they would never do it. So, a lot of people have felt tricked by that. And that's again, you know, what we can call open washing because it's claiming that 
we are using open source free software and we actually don't use open source free software. Okay, that's another example. Uh, another problem that we that we have faced in you know in the period where we were precisely trying to uh, uh, being in, engaged in this open government process uh, was some regressions in um, fundamental rights. I mean, that's at least what say several CSOs that focus on, on those things, like La Quadrature du Net, uh, like uh, La Ligue des Droits de l'Homme, uh, who are complaining about, uh, for instance, the fact that it's been over than a year that we are in the state of emergency in France right now. So the, to, to explain that to you, the state of emergency is a particularly, um, how can I say that? I mean, it's something in the Constitution that allows the government to do things that they're not allowed to do in normal times, like arresting people, putting them in jail, uh, closing down some websites, you know, do this kind of thing, which normally goes through uh, justice. So, and what basically, on this, on, on this particular side, what we say is that you cannot really explain that you're going to improve democracy, organize the COP21 of democracy in France, um, and you know, do this kind of thing, and at the same time, uh, having this kind of measure. I mean, to give you another example, and, and this, this will be the last one, yeah. if you allow me. The, okay, so the Supreme Court condemned the French state for uh, arbitrary uh, arrestations of people just because they were black or they were, you know, they had the, not the right color. That's one. I mean, that, that's another thing. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Sorry for being too long. Plenty of time to discuss afterwards. So let's continue to the pitch with Yago. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the very good This is the last speech, so if I, if I have forgotten anyone, so you can just come forward and you can pitch to one. Even the keyboard is a French accent. So I will say, if you want to, to pitch a project at the web, you can just come forward and we... You can finish after this uh, last speech. If I have forgotten anyone, I'm sorry, but you can uh, skip them forward as well. And we'll, uh, we'll adhere to, to the speech, please. Uh, projects 
with uh, electronics, but also with furniture, architecture, whatever. So uh, this kind of free software movement has jumped out of the code, and they start uh, being used in different activities in Madrid, uh, as designing public spaces, furniture, or whatever. So uh, what I'm doing in Miguel Prado is a center on democracy and on participatory democracy. So we, we are running a lab called Participa Lab, and this, this lab has like a longer name, and it's Collective Intelligence for Participatory Democracy Lab. So uh, we believe that there is some kind of uh, future democracy, and it has to be a del 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 deliberative democracy using the networks, using new technology. And in this lab, we, we work in a collaborative way to produce prototypes and to help uh, prototypes that are, that are already working, for example, Consul in Madrid, to work in, in a more intelligent way and more, in a more representative way. So uh, this is a, a design, a draw, made in our last hackathon. It was a Collective Intelligence for Democracy hackathon, and this was 15 days hackathon. So it, we involved like 100 people coming from all, all of the world, and they, we made a call and we select eight projects, and there were projects of digital tools for democracy, so in concrete, uh, um, each project has eight collaborators, also, co also coming from an open call, so uh, we were working hard in Media La Prado for, uh, for two weeks, and, and I think one or two of the projects are coming to the OGP toolbox also, uh, I want to make you an example of one of these projects, um, so you can figure out how, uh, which are the, the, the thematics that we are on, into. And it's called um, Argos Project. It's going to be in the toolbox, and it's about collaborative uh, legislation, and it's based on a path, on a wave technology, and uh, we, we are trying to make uh, the, the path, the collaborative writing, scale to thousands of people. Uh, with the commenting, uh, and the commenting options. So imagine uh, uh, writers, uh, they don't have to decide the contents and to negotiate between them, but they have to reduce the conflictiveness of the document. So uh, every comment has also a, um, a reference to the text, and they say if, if they do have to check the text or, do, or if the text is correct. So finally, uh, writers, what they have to do is to try to reduce conflictiveness of the document, uh, figuring out what's going on in the comments line of the of the path. So this is an example, and I invite you to come to Miguel Prado uh, and join uh, join us if you come to Madrid. And also we will announce the next call because we will do it again this big hackathon next year. So I invite all the projects here to just uh, submit a project or just come in, come as collaborators. And that's it. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, so it's Sia from Taiwan again. I'm very happy uh, all of you to be here, and we're honored to be uh, collaborating with Open Democracy now. Um, so there's one last thing I want to say uh, before we have more drinks. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have about 20 people from Taiwan for this delegation, and you please find them uh, during the OGP summit. But one interesting thing is that uh, even Taiwan ranked number one in the Open Data Index next uh, last year uh, by the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, we are not actually being uh, accepted to join OGP because uh, we are in relationship with, with China. As you probably know, uh, Mr. Donald Trump has called the Taiwan president and started some international interesting uh, he said he, he said you called him. Yeah, well, vice versa. <laughs> but, um, but as you can see, our government has been uh, trying hard to do uh, the participation and uh, uh, open government stuff. Uh, maybe a little bit, some of them are empty promises like the French government, but I think they're trying and they deserve to be in the global conversation. So if you'd like to support Taiwan for uh, joining the OGP, uh, please take a sticker back there and then just put it somewhere in the venue. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anyone want to do a last pitch for you know surprise project or anything? No? So well we can go back to what we, we were doing first. 
enjoying some drinks. And uh, well, thank you very much for attending these, these talks. Have a good summit. And thank you again for the webinar for letting us have a good place to dress for See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.